Um, we've, uh, we've, we've talked about American strategy in the First World War. We're now going to talk about the role of the American Expeditionary Force in the fighting of the First World War with our colleague Jennifer Keene. And Jennifer Keene is Professor of History and Chair of the History Department at Chapman University in Orange, California. She's published three books on American involvement in the First World War, including Doughboys, The Great War and the Remaking of America, The United States and the First World War, and World War I, The American Soldier Experience. She is a widely published scholar. She's the Vice President of the Society for Military History. Um, so that those of you, any of you who, is, who are interested in traveling to uh, the land of the barbarians to the north should know that the Society for Military History's upcoming conference will be in Ottawa, Canada, so the, the capital of the land of the barbarians. Um, but she's, <laughs> she's involved in a, in, a variety, in, a, in a variety of projects, and a couple that I want to mention, they're listed on her biography, but it's worth, worth noting that she serves as the general editor for the 1914-1918 online peer-reviewed encyclopedia of World War I, which you should definitely check out. Um, and she is the lead author for a U.S. history textbook. Always good to mention textbooks in front of high school teachers. Visions of America, a history of the United States, which is now in its third edition. Uh, so with her paper, What Went Wrong, What Went Right, The American Army on the Western Front, please uh, give a rousing welcome to Professor Jennifer Keene. Great. Well, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, and you're probably happy that I'm a little far from you. I, I felt sorry for the people on me in the plane yesterday since I, I have a little bit of a cold, um, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get through this okay. A lot of what I have to talk about this afternoon uh, sort of mirrors the, our Doug's talk. Um, there's some similar material that we're going to cover, but I think our two talks will be interesting for you to think about in comparison because I think we frame the material somewhat differently, and that's always a great uh, thing to hear how different historians can actually approach a, a similar moment in history and a similar set of facts and maybe organize them in a different kind of interpretive framework. And so I, I hope that you will see us not as just repeating each other, but actually offering some different perspectives on what we think is really essential to understand about the US Army on the Western Front. Okay. Now, I want to start off by just really outlining what the, the true accomplishment of the United States Army is during the First World War. And it's worth really recognizing that the U.S. created its largest army to date in 1917, 1918. We, we went you saw from that earlier slide from a force of 200,000 to over 4 million men in a very, very short period. And we sent 2 million of those men overseas, um, the kind of thing we had just never done before. Right? So I think when we look back, it's easy to, um, it's very easy <laughs> to be critical of all the things that went wrong, but we should also take a moment to pause and reflect on the fact that we were also asking ourselves to do something we had, in fact, never done before. And so that, I think, in a sense, is, is a, a worthwhile point to make right from the very beginning. And of course, the most tragic thing that did go wrong was also alluded to this morning, which was the high casualty rate during the time in which Americans were involved in active operations. And we have about 52,000 American men who are killed in what amounts to six months of really active fighting on the Western Front. And I always get into a lot of arguments with people about whether or not this is a lot or a little. It's nothing that's going to irritate me more than somebody telling me that America was barely bloodied in World War I, because I don't think 52,000 men dying in six months is barely bloodied. And so when people say that to me, I say to them, well, in six months of fighting in Iraq, if 52,000 coffins had come home in the first six months, I don't think anybody would have suggested that this was an insignificant loss. So we'll just get that one out of the way right at the beginning. <laughs> um, and so since I've sort of begun by giving you something I think that was pretty extraordinary, the fact that we actually raised this force and also something I think that went really wrong, the high casualty rates that we suffered, 
this is really what I want to do for my talk today, which is to offer a kind of balance sheet here in terms of what went right and what went wrong, and then also consider some of the lessons that Americans derived from this military experience. Now, I wanted to talk for a second a little bit about the overall involvement of the United States in the war. And again, Doug touched on some of this. Um, my map's a little bit different, so I think maybe offers a little bit of a different perspective on this. And we know that the United States doesn't enter until 1917, two and a half years after war started. And we know that because we were unprepared to fight in this war, it would take us nearly a year to raise, train, and transport this force overseas. So we begin the war, or we enter the war, excuse me, in April of 1917, but it will take a full year to really have any substantial number of troops overseas. And those troops will fight in a war that has changed quite a bit from the sort of trench deadlock that Americans had been reading about in their newspapers in 1915 and 1916, and even into 1917. And that is, of course, because in 1918, the front will indeed start moving again. And this is going to be important because it means that the United States will not only be raising a, a, a mass army and that it hasn't ever done before, have to train those men, which it has never had to do before, transport them over to Europe, which it has never done before. But it is also going to be fighting in a year in which the combat situation is changing continuously. So there'll be moments where Americans are indeed in the trenches, fighting in a more traditional trench warfare situation, but also because the War of Movement returns to the front in 1918, they will also be having to fight a war of movement. And in that sense, the United States will not just face the question of how do we break the trench deadlock, but they'll be facing this question of how do we sustain momentum in battle once that trench lock has been, has been broken. And I'm thinking of this question we had from this morning about logistics and you know, creating an entire American army that can actually function as an independent army. And we'll see that, in fact, um, it's not just training the frontline troops, but those problems of supply and logistics will cause tremendous problems for the United States once it begins to try to fight in a war of movement. Okay. Now, as Americans go overseas and they face this sort of strategic situation, it's worth noting um, that for the first part of their fighting and training, most American doughboys are very aware of the fact that the United States is fighting as part of a coalition. And by this I mean that the United States is not alone in trying to create this American army. It's of tremendous strategic significance to the Allies, not only that the Americans enter the war, but that as many troops as possible get over as fast as possible to Europe, and that also they get into the front lines as fast as possible. And so many American doughboys, especially those that come in the spring and summer of 1918, will actually do a fair amount of training with Allied units. They'll learn the basics of trench warfare, really have their baptism of fire by training with French and British units. And several of them will actually fight in French and British commanded operations. Um, if we see in Chateau Thierry, uh, Cantigny, which is where we're sort of our namesake here, uh, Bella Wood, you know, these are all battles that occur after the Germans have broken through in the spring of 1918, the so-called German offensives where they almost get to Paris once again. We have the Second Battle of the Marne, where once again they're stopped just about 35 miles outside of Paris. And it looks like this moment where you know, America might really have entered too late. It might really all be over. And American units come into the lines quickly and then are part of that counteroffensive, pushing the Germans back over the summer all the way back to that, that dotted line here. And in these operations, these are, these are coalition operations. These are operations in which American soldiers are fighting under French, uh, mostly French, and sometimes British command. So the sense that even from the very beginning, America is part of a larger war effort is very apparent to those soldiers on the ground. And then, of course, by the fall of 1918, if we come farther down here on the map, uh, this is when America takes over its own sector of the Western Front 
and will fight in two uh, American commanded battles. The first is the Battle of San Miguel, which we have here from September 12th through the 16th. Um, and then the second will be the Meuse Organ. And this, these two battles occurred within just uh, two weeks of each other. And so this will, as I, I'm telling you all the challenges that Americans will face in terms of not just having to learn trench warfare, but now having to learn how to you know, actually fight a war of movement, keep that momentum going. When we think about Americans fighting in Samiel and then having to swing up two, two, uh, two weeks later, they have to move their entire army almost 60 miles to get into position to fight in the Meuse or Gun region, which was an, a region that was really uh, well fortified, forested, very, very difficult, even for an experienced army. We start getting a sense um, that maybe we should cut the American army a little bit of a break, because in fact, what they were trying to do was extremely, extremely difficult. Right? But what I want to say before I, I get into some of the specifics here, um, is what I've just told you, um, like nobody knows anything about it, right? I mean, it's the 100th anniversary of the First World War, and, and the First World War historians among us are, we're so happy because people finally want to talk about America's experience in the First World War. But I talk to a lot of audiences, and I always ask my audiences this question, um, which is whether or not they can name the most lethal battle in American history. And I will tell you that almost nobody gets it right. Even though I'm talking about the First World War, you'd think that would be like a big hint. <laughs> but still, I'll always get the answers like Gettysburg or Battle of the Bulge or uh, Antietam, things like that. And then I, I, I say, well, OK, so Let's go to where we all go when we don't know questions, to Wikipedia. And uh, here we can see the list of most lethal battles in American history. And, and of course, the first battle is the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Right? So the Meuse-Argonne Offensive is the most lethal battle in American history. It will be a battle that I can guarantee you most people have never, ever even heard of. Right. And we can look at some of the specifics of it. Right? 47 days, 1.2 million men take part in it. We have 22, 26, 227 killed just in this battle. Right? So given the number I gave you before, that's over half, oh, almost half right, of the entire number of battlefield casualties that we have in World War I. 100,000 men wounded, 100,000 stragglers. And the question is, why doesn't anybody know about this, right? Why don't we remember this battle um, and its significant cost to the United States? And here, it might be, in fact, because examining the battle in too much detail seems to reveal so many mistakes and errors that it doesn't fit very well into the traditional kind of combat narrative we like to, to tell ourselves, which is of our great victories and our great ability to overcome obstacles. In a battle that seems to reveal more mistakes than successes, it's sort of a dissatisfying story to tell, even though we win the battle, and it is, in many respects, a significant battle in winning the war. Right? The large numbers of casualties that we see here this also raises unque uncomfortable questions about the competency of US military leaders, right? If we say there were so many mistakes and there were so many men that died and we start asking why those men died and we start asking whether these mistakes could have been avoided, um, then maybe we want to begin holding Pershing and generals accountable. And it is interesting to think about the different fates that Pershing and Haig have in the post-war world. Right? Douglas Haig, whose reputation continues to slide downward the more that people investigate the Battle of the Somme until sort of recently when there's been a kind of new revisionism of, of, uh, according to Haig, we see that Pershing's reputation is pretty much untarnished until the 1980s when historians begin to look at depth in terms of what happens in the Meuse, in the Meuse Argonne. Right? And so I'm just laying all of this out to you in a way of, I think, of some sort of interesting questions that we can examine about American soldiers' experiences overseas. So I want to step back 
and offer my assessment of what I think went right and what went wrong for Americans on the Western Front. And the first thing that I'm going to say went right, and I think you can get this sense already from the way I've sort of introduced this talk, is this, is this simple achievement of raising a mass army quickly and relatively efficiently. Um, this really was quite a tremendous achievement. And it's even more interesting when we think about the fact that it's not just raising the numbers that actually uh, was new, but it was the way that we went about it that was new as well. And that was that we went immediately to a system of selective service to conscription. And we had never done that before. We had certainly used the draft before in the past, but in the past the draft was an alternative to the much preferred tactic of relying on volunteers. And we would just turn to the draft pretty much when people had stopped volunteering and now we needed to keep the war for going. And it was really almost a, a punishment to be seen as drafted. It was kind of an inducement to get people to, to enlist. But things are different in the First World War. And in the First World War, we go to the draft right from the very beginning. And we will see that 72% of the army will, in fact, be drafted. Okay. And there were reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons was the quick na nature of the, of the mobilization. That if you took it all over from the beginning, this was a way to ensure that it could happen fast. It was a recognition, and this kind of speaks to Mike's lecture this morning, that we already understood that this was a total war situation, that our economic output was going to be as important as our manpower in terms of contributing to the ultimate victory on the Allied side. And so if, the, if we, in fact, use conscription to raise our military force, we have a, a better ability to control potential disruptions to the economy. So in other words, people would register for the draft and then could be deferred if they were working in, in necessary wartime uh, um, endeavors. And so this became the mantra of people actually um, uh, excuse me, the, the mantra of efficiency, right, in terms of we're going to raise this army as efficiently as possible. And we can see the, um, the, the, the philosophy here when we even think about what this new system is called, right, because before that a draft is a draft. And in World War I, this is when we start calling the draft what we call it today, which is selective service. Right. And it's the idea that every man will register of draft eligible age, but only some will be selected to serve in the military. And the others will, in a sense, be selected to serve the war effort at home. But everybody is serving in some kind of capacity for, um, for the nation in terms, of, in terms of, um, of raising this mass army. Right Now, we say what lessons did people learn about World War I, and we should recognize that even in World War I, people were also trying to learn some lessons, and they were trying to learn some lessons from the last time that the uh, federal government had tried to institute a draft, namely what happened during the Civil War. And they remembered, well, two things. One was that by introducing the draft in the middle of the war. It had been very unpopular. There had been draft riots. There was a sense that the government was having to force reluctant American citizens to continue this war. So they learned that lesson by having the draft immediately enacted at the beginning. But the second thing that they learned was the process by which men actually registered for the draft. And in the Civil War, it had been an individual process where a federal register came around and kind of knocked on, house, knocked on doors, would register men individually. It made it, in a sense, easy for people to evade their responsibility. So consequently, in the First World War, they do it completely differently, which is that they make registration a public process. And so we have a National Registration Day. And on June 5th, 1917, basically the country shuts down for the day in order for there to be public parades and celebrations and festivities around men like literally walking into public places and, and registering for the draft. And so it won't be something that you can just do or not do in private. It's something that you do publicly in front of uh, everybody in your community. And, and the communities really participate actively in this. Draft wards come from local citizens. 
uh, the names of men who, who don't show up to register for the draft are published in the newspaper. There's a lot of ways in which the government relies on the sort of self-policing of local communities to get men to register for the draft. And we can debate whether or not this is appropriate, but I don't think we can debate whether or not it's successful, because in fact, it turns out to be pretty successful. Uh, we have 24 million men register, um, just in that first registration uh, period alone. And, and as, again, Doug kind of mentioned, uh, in, uh, included among these men will be hundreds of thousands of immigrants. In fact, so many immigrants. One out of every five soldiers in the American army were foreign born. So it's not an insignificant group of American soldiers to talk about immigrant soldiers in the American army. Uh, and this, of course, reflects the waves of immigration to the United States, right? So the U.S. was successful in terms of numbers. It was successful in terms of process. It was successful in terms of recruiting, uh, excuse me, drafting in uh, recent immigrants into the American army. But, of course, as I said, this is a balance sheet, so what went wrong? Some things went wrong with the process of raising this army as well. Uh, there were men who evaded the draft. Nearly 3 million, or 11% of the draft eligible male population refused to register or report. And here I can say this now because I think Mike already left. But here's where I might, dis <laughs> I might disagree a little bit with Mike. <laughs> I, I think that there um, was a little bit more uh, opposition to the war than maybe he uh, he spoke about this this morning. I think that there were definitely strong pockets of anti-war resistance, especially in the rural South, and this is where we found the most draft evasion during uh, during during the conflict. So there were not necessarily everybody in America was convinced by 1917 this was a war that we needed to fight. But this is what I think really went wrong. What really went wrong with the American mobilization effort was the refusal to tap fully into the skills and manpower of African-American soldiers. And I know that when we often talk about African-Americans, and Chad's going to give you, I'm sure, a, a fantastic talk on this uh, later on this afternoon, we sometimes talk about it as, a, as a, a separate story from the story of actually the entire American war effort. And I think that in this particular instance, that shows us what a mistake it is to not acknowledge how, how, um, how much the United States weakened its war effort by its policies of segregation and discrimination. Now, the Army saw it differently. What they believed was that racial segregation was a path towards efficiency, that if they segregated the races, this would keep white soldiers happy. It would reduce uh, or at least eliminate racial violence. Right? And this is kind of the progressive argument endorsing segregation, that it promotes social order. Um, this is not what happened within the American army. And it's not even where the American army stopped. It went way beyond maintaining segregation. It insisted, for the most part, that African-American soldiers serve in non-combatant units. We had 89% of African-Americans who are non-combatants, not combatants. And even those who did serve as combatants um, found themselves constantly under attack within the American army, having to prove things that no white soldier was ever asked to prove. And we see this that the height of the Meuse Argonne campaign, when you would think that the American army would have other things to do. We see AAF officials going on a crusade against black officers, wasting valuable time to conduct court martials proceedings to remove them from the front lines. And more importantly, we see that in this kind of rigid segregation and racially discriminating environment, a very demoralized, often angry, black soldier population. And so rather than ensuring tranquility, what the Army had to spend a lot of time doing was quelling racial conflict and racial violence. And also, even by the end of the war, realizing that the poor morale of some African American soldiers uh, had, to be, had to be addressed. And so if you look at race relations in any serious way in the United States, you, excuse me, race relations within the American Army during the First World War, you can almost see a war within a war. And you can almost see Americans fighting with each other more than they're fighting against the Germans. And I find it hard to believe that we can argue that that is an efficient way to raise or run an American military. 
And so in that sense, even in this quest for efficiency, the United States found uh, it necessary to deny itself the full, um, full access to the manpower and skills that the African-American soldier population offered it. Right? So for the most part, we can therefore say that the nation was successful in raising the numbers that they needed to combat Germany's manpower advantage once Russia left the war. We heard a little bit, a little bit more um, about that, that this morning. And so my last point here about the idea of why raising this army is really such an important thing to consider as significant is if we think about the end of the war. Of course, the, the, the numbers of Americans entering the war matter. But if we think to the rationale that's often given for why Germany leaves the war in 1918 without any allied soldiers actually setting foot on German soil, the argument that's usually given is that the, the, the vision of just more and more Americans arriving in France just convinced Germany that there's no real reason to continue. And we have to therefore conclude that there's no way that America could have sent those millions of men without the functioning operation of the conscription system. And so in that sense, even those who never left the country contributed their part to the ultimate victory because they, just their presence and their, their commitment to actually comply with selective service regulations convinced Germany that the war was not worth fighting any longer. Okay. okay. So that's the part I think we want to emphasize about mobilizing the army. What about training American soldiers? Right? And so here's, again, just like in the mobilization, well, I would argue that we see a sort of mixed, a mixed result, right? And again, we start seeing the reality of America entering the war late and also of America fighting the war as part of an allied coalition, right? And even more importantly, not just part of a coalition, but a junior partner in that coalition, right? This tension between the United States and its allies, right, was going to be something that we saw again and again and again. America enters this war, and I think Mike, I, I totally would agree with him about this, um, many ways for to defend its own self-interest. But how the United States defends its, excuse me, defines its own self-interest is going to bump up again and again against the demands and needs of the allied coalition. Right? And so in this sense, in terms of thinking about how we form this army and train this army, I do think that some of the mistakes were due to Americans, Pershing, having a faulty and imperfect understanding of the war. But some of these mistakes happened because of issues out of Americans' control. And I think in that sense, it's mostly the timing of events, the way that things just begin to simply speed up in 19, 19, 1918 in a way that nobody could actually, um, actually imagine. And in this sense, America is always having to make adjustments. It's not good enough to create a plan in 1917 and say, hey, let's just implement this plan, because a year later, by April of 1918, the whole strategic situation has changed, and that plan doesn't actually work for you anymore. Okay. All right. So in organizing and training the American forces, Pershing established several principles that were meant to differentiate the American forces from the British. And the first thing that he did was he created divisions that were twice as large as the British, French, or German divisions. So American divisions would have 28,000 men. And Pershing wanted these larger divisions because he argued that this would increase their staying power in the field so that they could stay in the, in the line longer by being larger. But it also reflected a reality that, uh, of his that he actually didn't have enough senior officers to serve as divisional commanders. So this is a, a very clear example where we see the lack of preparedness and a small peacetime army actually affecting how the wartime army is going to be organized. Right? So in organizing these divisions, Pershing made another sort of, uh, made us, I should say, a key error here in terms of failing to realize that how much the war on the Western Front had become an artillery war. And so he has 
divisions that are twice the size in terms of numbers of infantry troops than French, British, and German divisions, but their artillery support is exactly the same. So you have twice as many infantry soldiers going into battle with the same, with basically half the artillery support of their allied uh, um, counterparts. Right? So the second thing that Pershing did to try to differentiate his army from the allied armies was to establish this doctrine of, of open warfare. And Doug talked a little bit about this here. And people have really struggled to understand what open warfare was. You actually can't find a sort of really coherent definition of it. It's not really sure exactly what Pershing meant. It was very vague, right? It was, it was this vague idea that um, that, Amer that people need to get out of the trenches and just start fighting already, right? Like they needed to do some, something to kind of break this trench uh, uh, deadlock. And, it, it, and Pershing was clear that he wanted an offensive spirit to permeate the American army. He felt that a defensive sort of static stance had taken hold of both sides. Um, and he believed in the infantry, right? He believed in mark marksmanship. And so, so Alvin York was a, was, was a perfect example of this, the idea of marksmanship being something that was going to enhance infantry firepower and, and promote initiative in battle. And really, if you look at York, he in some respects just epitomizes that, that version of open warfare really, really well in terms of what Pershing wanted. Um, now, in some respects, Pershing lucked out because of circumstances. His doctrine of open warfare actually fit pretty well in term, uh, on a battlefield in 1918, because in a sense, when the Germans had broken through the front, and even when the French were pushing them back, these armies were already beginning to employ some of those tactics of open warfare. So the elements of open warfare that Pershing espoused, which were individual and line commander initiative, using ground cover to advance, irregular formations, rifle power, these were all things that the British and even the Germans were already using in 1918. And so to, for Americans to come over and to begin to em employ that, you can see that, uh, that I don't think that, that in terms of his doctrinal approach, he was actually mistaken. The problem was that the Germans, in breaking through the line in 1918, actually employed those ideas successfully. The United States found it much more difficult to implement the doctrine of their own commander um, when they hit the battlefield. And the thing that really, really was problematic was, to, was how to integrate artillery into the open warfare doctrine. And this was really, again, now we see this earlier decision of having fewer artillery units in AAF divisions begins to come back to haunt the AAF when they come into battle, right? And in the beginning, they decide to arm their artillery units with heavy French 75 and 155 millimeter guns, but these are guns that are static. And again, as you begin to move forward, those are guns that are difficult to move forward with the, um, with the infantry. So when soldiers were successful in breaking out into the open to fight, they quickly outpaced their artillery support. And so this, this integration of combined arms doctrine, which would eventually also include air support, this is, this is the difficult part of creating an army quickly from scratch. You can get the men into the army. You can teach them how to fire a gun. But now they have to learn how to coordinate as a division into, into complex combat pieces that are not just about what one person does or another person does. It's how they work together. And having those different puzzle pieces combine and support each other as they're moving forward in a chaotic battlefield situation in which communication, can you think about the, the uh, carrier pigeon here, communication is, is imperfect at best. This is very difficult and this is, this is something that the American army is learning to do on the fly. Right? And, and the men who go into battle and use our gun pay the cost of the American army learning how to do this. Right? And all of these things would certainly provide lessons to the American army moving forward, right? And after the war, one of the things the army would focus on was the need to improve its effectiveness to provide better firepower to support infantry troops in the field, as well as liaison and communication um, uh, to reduce instances of friendly fire, okay? Now, the third way that Pershing wanted to distinguish U.S. 
armed forces from the Allies was through this creation of an independent, fully functional military. And, and Doug mentioned the amalgamation controversy, and this really had legs to it because, you know, especially as the military ended up, in fact, excuse me, the American military ended up being amalgamated with the Allied forces, at least temporarily, through that period here of the spring and summer of 1918, like right when I'm talking about Chateau Thierry and then moving in these counteroffensives, there is, in a sense, a sort of amalgamation. And there are four African-American regiments from the Provisional 93rd who are also amalgamated into the, into, into the French army. At first, they thought temporarily, and of course, they end up serving the entire war with the French. So the amalgamation controversy is not something that's sort of resolved ever. It, it's, it's a continuing argument that the United States has with the Allies throughout the war. And the Allies have an efficiency argument, right? Their efficiency argument is everything I've just told you, right? This is complicated business, right? And we have that infrastructure, right? We have, we have the artillery, we have the liaison, we have the communication, we have the supply lines, we have the rail lines. You know, just what we need are, man, are men. So funnel your men into our existing units, and we will, we will be able to bolster our side and fight and fight more effectively, right? And, and in a sense, so it's not, I think, just a spurious claim. But of course, the United States had an argument too, which is that, well, one of the reasons you need our guys is because you've squandered so many men of your own, right? And one of the things that Pershing was the most afraid of was that by giving Allied soldiers, um, excuse me, American soldiers to the, to the French, um, that they would be much more willing, in fact, to take on risky assaults because there would be fewer political costs to them if American lives were lost. And, and I, I don't think that, I, I think there's something to this claim as well because there's been some recent work done on French West African soldiers who fought for the French, claiming that by 1918 there was sort of a very intentional use of them as shock troops to open advances to save white French lives. That this was not just happening, this was something that was done quite in, in, intentionally. So in that sense we can see that there were some military arguments for or against amalgamating American soldiers into um, into French units. But of course the biggest argument against was the political argument. And I think that that's what Doug outlined well this morning as well. The idea here that one of the reasons that the United States needed to establish an independent presence on the Western Front was to serve the political goals of the war, right? And we should never forget that very famous quote that we all pull out some, at some point from Clausewitz, right? War is politics by other means, right? So we are there for a political reason. And the political reason to get into the war may have been to defend ourselves. But the political reason to fight, to continue to fight the war and to win the war certainly becomes for Woodrow Wilson to have a seat at the Versailles Peace Treaty. And that's not going to happen without an independent American presence and an independent evidence that America made a distinctive contribution to the victory. And American soldiers fighting under French command is not going to provide Wilson with the, with the um, what do I want to say, the legitimacy that he needs to go to Versailles and actually speak with authority at this peace conference. And so this would, you know, would clearly be one of the major reasons why the United States would insist on, on um, forming, excuse me, an independent American presence on the, on the Western, on the Western Front here, right? Now, when we think about how fast-paced events begin to impact these larger principles, we can start seeing that there's ways in which just the simple pace of events are beginning to change things. And so here I want to come back to the Meuse-Orgone Offensive just to offer an example of this. Okay? Now, we had this idea here in, in Pershing in terms of looking at the battlefield, had always believed that these problems that I'm outlining to you, which it's not that he didn't understand this, he saw the problems that he had with his, with his army. Um, it was just that 
events were somehow beginning to get away from him. And the first set of events that get away from him are these ones that I'm telling you here when there's an emergency, right? You know, as the, the Germans are coming down on Paris, I mean, what does he say? Well, you know, I want to create an independent army and I really, I need another year before I can help you out, right? They're coming to him. It's an emergency. He agrees to um, put partially trained troops in combat situations. Over the summer, as they're beginning to push the Germans back, he says, well, I want to create an independent American army. Oh, but I understand that what you really need are infantry troops. So he begins to privilege in his troop transport prioritization infantry troops over supply troops throughout the summer. Right? So throughout the summer, you have, you have combat troops coming to France, but you don't have logistical and support troops coming, coming to France. Now, now, earlier, they'd had a beautiful schedule. It was all going to be synchronized, right? But what does he say to his allies who are telling him, we just need these men, we need them now, right? And all of these things become important later on down the line because if you get into the habit of sending partially trained troops into, into battle in the spring of 1918, by the fall of 1918, they're doing exactly the same thing in Samuel. If you privilege bringing over your infantry troops in the summer of 1918, when you get to the fall of 1918, and you're in the Meuse Argonne Offensive, and everybody talks a lot about you know, the total chaos in the rear, right, where there's just these, you've probably seen this picture at least, these massive traffic jams, right, and these you know, um, advances that get stalled because they can't bring supply lines on. Well, this is that decision coming back to haunt you because you haven't been, been bringing those, those, men, those men over. And part of that is because of, uh, of purging, but part of it is also because of concessions that he makes to his allies and, and the fact that he's fighting this war as a coalition, not just, not just by him himself. And so the juniorness of the United States in this coalition becomes very obvious as time goes on. And it means that the US is not independently able to control all the circumstances by which Americans fight. And I think we have to contextualize it this way to kind of really balance out not just what went right and what went wrong, but where we want to sort of place the blame or the, or the, or the um, praise for those, for those things, okay? And we can see this in a, in a final way here when we even think about what happens um, with the Musargon campaign. So I told you that you know, they fight in Samiel and then within two weeks have to shift their army forward. And you might think, well, why would you do that? I mean, that's tough, right? And that really puts the United States Army at a disadvantage in the opening days of the Musargon campaign. And part of what happens is the Samiel offensive has been carefully planned. It's to reduce the salient in the lines, they spent a lot of staff work on it. They know exactly what they want to do. Um, and this is part of Pershing's idea of pushing up towards Metz by 1919. And at the very last minute, Fernand Foch, who's taken over as Supreme Allied Commander, comes to Pershing and says, we, we've called it off. We don't want you to do it. Because now we're going to have this general offensive. We want you to move your soldiers up to Musargon. That's where you're going to fight instead. And and Pershing is furious, right? He's furious. He's furious because he's sort of the rugs being pulled out from him at the last minute. He's being asked to take on a much more difficult tactical challenge um, because in the Meuse Argonne, we have got a heavily wooded, a very well defended area. It's not going to be um, easy. And in a sense, he's not even really expected to make much headway. What he's expected to do there is sort of you know, hold the Germans off and prevent them from reinforcing their lines further north when the, Allies, when the British and French attack. And Samuel was going to be a showcase for the American army. It was going to be, he felt, a pretty good victory. And this would be a, a way to demonstrate that America could orchestrate its own independent fight. So the compromise is not to call off the Samuel offensive, Pershing decides to go forward with it anyway. Uh, it, is, it is a pretty resounding victory for the US, 
But as I've suggested, they're going to pay the price with the Muse or gun. And this could be one answer for the question I posed earlier, which is, why does Pershing escape blame for what happens in the Muse or gun? And one answer could be is that, you know, Pershing and his officers were quite bitter about the French at the last minute, French at the last minute, changing, changing these plans, and really felt that the high casualties that the American army suffered was, was, yes, partially the things I've told you, the difficulties of training, the uh, difficulties of terrain, and certainly the problem of combined arms uh, tactics, but it was also a last minute strategic change that kind of set the Americans up uh, to, a certain, to a certain extent and kind of reinforced the idea that the Allies were willing to expend American lives uh, without much thought. Right? Now, uh, the Musar gun was successful. It was, it was bloody. We can uh, debate what ultimately it ends up meaning. I, I want to, uh, just let me just work here. I want to talk about this figure right here because this figure became something that was very open to interpretation during and after the battle. And that is that in addition to it being a long, a long battle, the most lethal battle, a massive battle with num high numbers of men and large numbers of unit, was the kind of staggering straggler figure that was attached to the battle. Because 100,000 men out of 1.2 million, it's almost 10% of your force that you're saying at some point wasn't moving forward, right? It was straggling. These were men that were rounded up in the rear. And what did this actually signify, right? And there's a lot of debate over what this signified. Does this signify poor leadership and just how disorganized the AEF was that these men, because you know, anybody that's caught is of course immediately just lost, right? So is this signal guys that are the, really the kind of just, you know, breakdown of, of the organization as going forward? Does it signal the reality of sending poorly trained men into battle who, who can't withstand the, 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 the challenges? Uh, does it suggest that you can conscript men, but they maybe didn't really want to fight? Um, and then lately, actually, there's been a new interpretation coming out, which is suggesting that a lot of these men were not stragglers, they were sick, because this was exactly the moment that the Spanish influenza epidemic was, was sweeping through the AEF, and so a lot of these guys just... Um, you know, kind of just because it comes on so suddenly and there's almost nothing you can do that they sort of just like literally just fell down where they were and just hunkered down hoping that they, you know, waiting for themselves to feel better so they could get to a hospital, right? And so, that's, so I just kind of um, point this out to you because I feel like how people explain that 100,000 strangler number Straggler, I think I said straggler. Straggler number almost becomes a litmus test for what they want to emphasize about what the Muse or Gun campaign actually actually means. Okay. So I just want to wrap up by um, thinking for a second here about what this does mean to Americans at the time, and this is the thing about forgetting. Because we've forgotten, we assume Americans always forgot, but I would argue that in the post-war period, especially the 1920s and 1930s, Americans did not forget World War I, and they did not forget the high death toll attached to World War I for the United, for the United States. And it really influenced, in a sense, the kind of popular culture memory that would develop as a result of these high casualty rates attached to the American experience of the war. And so I wanted to just show you this painting here by John Stuart Curry, Parade to War Allegory, because it's a very interesting painting in terms of thinking about how America is recalling this memory of the First World War, trying to learn a lesson from it in 1938, as it looks likely that perhaps another war might occur. And so if we look at the painting here, we can see that at the center, we have a young couple. Um, she's sending her sweetheart off to war. And these young boys here at the bottom, they sort of have their heads down. They're all, they're not even really looking, but they're caught up in the pageantry of war. And we have to go out to the sides of the painting. I hope you can see this. It looks really dark from my perspective, so I can't tell if you can see it or not. Um, 
If we go out to the side of the painting, we can see that there are some women lurking in the shadows. And so one to the left is, a, is the mother, a mother who's lost her son, and she's sort of quietly weeping. And then here to the right, we have a war widow, and she's trying to reach the couple to warn them, but the police officer is standing in her in her way, not letting her speak. But perhaps the most interesting part is if we really look at the faces of these men, we can see that in fact they're turning into corpses right before our eyes. They are, they are already the dead. They are already gone, right? And so this idea that modern war means massive death and massive casualties is I think something that's very well established in the American psyche, not just because of the high rates of European casualties, but because of the high rates of casualties in the American army. But now I'm going to conclude on a completely different potential point, <laughs> which is that during the meuse argonne campaign, an inspector general's report included this statement. Sending so many untrained men into battle, this inspector general's report concluded, was little short of murder how we have escaped a catastrophe is a clear demonstration of the German demoralization. Did America's contribution to the final victory have to be so costly? Now, much of what I've suggested today says no. But this quote, I think, suggests a different answer, which is that it could have been much worse. Thank you very much. So I think I have time for questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, Jim Feldman, uh, St. Clair Shores, Michigan. Uh, I have a question is about the racial uh, incidents that happened during the war. Was uh, well, Harry Truman was an artillery officer. Did he have any experience with African-American soldiers that may have led him to desegregate the troops in uh, 48? Thank you. I, I don't think that any of them, Ch Chad can probably uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think that Harry Truman's decision to desegregate the army in 1948 came from his any personal experiences that he had in the First World War. I, I mean, I think there were a lot of reasons for why he chose to do that, but I don't believe that that was... I've never, I've never heard that it was because of any personal uh, interactions that he had or experiences that he had, no. Um, but I think that, you know, certainly Truman was, well, here's a good difference between Harry Truman and Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> I mean, Harry Truman was very shocked by attacks on returning black servicemen from World War II, and there was one in particular, Isaac Woodward, who was blinded because um, because he was beaten for taking too long to use the restroom at a stop, um, you know, when he was traveling home. He was in uniform, and this was very sure shocking to Truman, and although it's not the only thing that caused him to issue that order, you see that he was really personally and morally troubled that you could send men to fight for your country, and this was the kind of return they had home. Mm. But, you know, returning servicemen in 1919 are attacked, lynched, and you don't see Woodrow Wilson coming out and saying, you know, this is wrong. You have this kind of, you know, sort of denunciation of lynching in 1918, but nothing to really call the country to account for, um, for you know, the man who's all rhetorical about democracy. You know, he's not calling them to account in terms of the, you know, the discrepancy here. So it's not really an answer to your question, but, but, um, but I think in terms of connecting, to connecting the two. Well, I guess I, I'm glad I gave you the opportunity to bag on Wilson a little bit, too, yeah. because you, you missed that. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> sorry, I know that's right. <laughs> sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that how people are doing it in turn? Yes, mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah. I'm looking for a hand Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, George Haldeman from Muscoda High School, Illinois, and I'm a psychology teacher, and, uh, you know, anytime we're teaching, like, the history of psychology, we talk a lot about the importance of World War One with uh, shell shock and stuff. So can you talk about, uh, again, as far as, 
you know, the strategy, you know, how our soldiers maybe weren't mentally prepared to fight this war and, and again, how that might be a failure as far as preparing them to be ready to fight on the battlefront. Right. So that's really interesting in terms of psychology in the First World War because um, the First World War is one of the times, well, the first time when the Army, in terms of creating this new, efficient, modern military, does turn to social sciences to say, you know, what expertise could, say, psychologists offer us in helping us make men, you know, fight more efficiently and actually do a better job. And so psychology um, and psychologists actually have a huge role in, in creating this new Army, and they're, they're involved in, in several several aspects. Um, the first is through the introduction of intelligence testing, which is the first, this is the first time that there'll be sort of a massive use of intelligence tests. And so the, um, and part of that is to help the Army kind of identify uh, Un, unknown talent. So they, it, it, and this is again where you get this paradox with the military. On the one hand, it's the idea, well, let's not just assume that somebody comes from a good school or a good background to, that they should be the officer. Maybe we have some untapped skill. Let's use an intelligence test. This will give everybody a shot. And the intelligence tests are flawed. What they mostly show is how uneducated so many Americans are at this time. Uh, because of the large number of people that have to be given a test for illiterate. They have two tests, one for illiterates and one for literates, and they have to give many more people the test for illiterates than they expected. So that's one uh, sort of flawed promise, but that kind of opens up the door for intelligence testing by the military, by public schools, and these things. And then the second thing that you're talking about, which is almost sort of mental health screening, right? How could we d uh, figure out who's going to, who's the guy that's going to break down in battle, and who's the guy that's going to be able to withstand uh, combat? And that is also something that, in its infancy in the First World War, where people starting to give men tests to try to assess how likely are they actually to break down. And, and America, in this sense, is learning from the British and the French, because in 1917, they expect there to be shell shock, right? They expect there to be this kind of combat fatigue. They've seen it happen, and now they're trying to cut it off by trying to weed out those men um, who might be likely to succumb. Now, the problem with those tests is that they tend mostly to be about a history of mental disease in your family. It's kind of the idea that if you know your mom was schizophrenic, that you probably can't handle this, so either we're going to keep you stateside or maybe release you altogether. They don't really become very effective in terms of screening people. But the third part uh, in terms of psychology is the idea that you could um, you could put the man put men in the right fighting frame of mind by giving them strong reasons to fight, right? So why do men fight, right? Psychology always wants to know that. How can you make a man more willing to fight? And and these are men, so they be, what they begin to do, and, and this only happens stateside because the war ends, ends before they can bring it overseas, is they start creating a very formalized morale building program in the, in the United States. And these are social psychologists. And they argue that men need to know why they're fighting. If you're in a democracy, men have to, they have to believe in the cause. They're really talking about political indoctrination. It's not enough just to, you know, make them afraid of not fighting. And, and so, it's a, so, you know, this is a debate, right? Why do men fight? Do they fight for the guy next to them? Do they fight for their unit? Do they fight for their cause? These guys, they believe it's the cause. That's what they're, that's what they're really focusing on. And we know as we move forward in the 20th century that psychologists will disagree about that. So again, it's a long answer, but it's a great question because it really does go to show you just how much the military is also looking to civilian experts to help it build this army quickly and efficiently. So when the army knows that it's, that they themselves do not have this expertise because they have never tried to do this before, at this moment, they go outside and they bring these people in. Now, what will change is that over the course of the 20s and 30s and into the Second World War, they will start developing those experts for themselves. And so in the Second World War, they won't have to go. They'll do the same things, but they won't be looking outside for civilian expertise as much. They'll have already you know, cultivated that, you know, psychology and psychologists as a kind of internal, internal thing. 
Well, that's a good question. Um, I know they're not as high. I, I, I can't come up with them right from the beginning, but I know that they're not as high. And, and it, was, it was very interesting to see the different ways in which black American soldiers and black West French African soldiers were employed by the French army. Because um, you know, if, you, if you take the 369th Infantry Regiment, which is the most famous one that everybody knows, um, you know, they were in the lines for 191 days. They were there in the winter. They, 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 they were you know, they, they fought well and courageously and, and were considered very capable troops. The French West African soldiers um, be, were considered, uh, what I want to say, temperamentally unable to handle a French winter. So they were sent to the south, usually for six months. And this is what makes their, this is when you can lie with numbers, because the French could look at the average number of French West African deaths and say, oh, well, it's not any different. Look, if you compare it to white French, it's the same. But again, they were out of the line for six months. So I mean, in sense, statistically, they were tw it was much, much higher right, in terms of what's going on. But the, yeah, but my sense is that, again, Chad will correct me if I'm wrong, but my, <laughs> my sense is that, um, the, uh, that that did not happen to the American black soldiers who were with the French. Yeah. Okay, let me just remind you to press the button in front of your microphone before you ask the question and then press it again to turn it off when you're done. In the back there. Hi, Gene Hamacher from Lake Park here in Illinois. Um, a question, actually I have two, because one is actually a continuation of the intelligence testing. Do the National Guard units have to also go through that testing um, after they were switched over to be nationalized? Yeah, so that was, this was a policy that was implemented, again, not, it would all depend on the National Guard units when they were federalized into, into federal service. So out of, out of the four million men, they estimate that they actually gave intelligence tests to about half of them. So again, that all depends on your timing. So if you're, if you're, if you're coming in right away, like 26th Division, probably you, did, you, were never, you were never given an intelligence test because you were over in France before they actually had organized the entire, the entire process. But then any replacement troops that were coming in, all those men were being given intelligence tests. So, so again, this is a, it's a bureaucracy that's in the process of coming into being, so, not, so about, only about half of American soldiers ever took those tests. Okay. And then my other question actually was, um, when they did the um, selective service June 5th, let's go and have a party day. Were the African Americans also in the same lines or did they have separate areas? Um, how yeah, did that again, occur? It depends regionally. I mean, if you look at, um, I've done some work on this in terms of looking at, you know, literally at June 5th, like across the nation. And as you can imagine, you know, a lot of southern communities, you were, people were going to, uh, Here's the irony. You're supposed to go to your polling place to actually register <laughs> for the draft. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting, right? Especially in the Jim Crow South where people are disenfranchised, say, okay, well, we're going to, as if, you know, if, if you ever could go to your polling place, this is where it would be. Um, and then separate festivities, you know, where you talk about parades where there's, you know, first we're going to have the white parade and then this is going to be the colored parade and then they're going to split off and go to their separate parts of town and have their celebrations. Um, but again, it, it just depended sort of regionally because a lot of those things they were they were locate they were organized by local communities. So, and this is the thing about the draft. I mean, you can perceive the draft not incorrectly as the heavy hand of the federal government coming in and grabbing men and pulling them into the army. But just like Mike was saying, you know, we don't really have the people or the power in April, you know, May, June of 1917 for the federal government to do that without help. So we have to take on some of the responsibility too where local communities were very happy to organize themselves and spy on each other and ensure compliance. And, and in that sense, they're not gonna make the draft or the process of registering for the draft something that disrupts the status quo of their community, right? So if, whatever the racial status quo is of your community, your local 
team of people are in charge, right? So they can make the decisions about how that's going to go. Right? There's no sense of that. And the government's not suggesting that they threaten it in any kind of way, right? I mean, they're saying this is, you know, keep, it's fine to keep it as it is. Okay. You can Over there? Me. Yeah. Bruce Damasio, Towson University, Towson, Maryland. You were talking about um, amalgamation and amalgamation. So I'm interested in you expanding that from your talk in regards to the issue you brought up with pictures about the problems behind the front lines. So I'm, I'm curious, during the Second World War, there were the Red Ball Express and the logistics as the Allies went east, they just simply ran out of getting supplies to the right place at the right time. But in this case, if there was a resistance to amalgamation at the front, did that carry over into the logistics side of things where when you unloaded at the channel ports, who was responsible for getting it to the front lines? And if so, where were the problems? Did yeah. It... yeah, and I mean, and, excuse me, there were, there were a lot of problems in terms of logistics, and, and, and that, that logistical set of problems, you know, it, you, it's most evident at the front, but you could almost literally tra trace it back to, you know, gridlock on railroads in the United States in 1917, right? So where you, you know, if you can't get you know, so there, so at almost every step of the way, there is a problem, right? And you, so, you, so you've got a problem just getting your material from factories and farms on U.S. railroads to ports. On ports, you have to get shipping space. Who's prioritizing that shipping space, and what are they prioritizing you to send, right? So in terms of troops, I, I mentioned that they're prioritizing infantry troops, but even in terms of materiel, what materiel are they actually, actually prioritizing? Um, then, and most of that shipping is going to be on the British. So there's constant negotiations with the British over shipping space, right? Of giving us more shipping space for what we what we need. It's easy to say to America, we need your help, but there's a finite America, number of ships, and America begins a huge shipbuilding program. But again, that's not really going to you're not going to see much evidence of that having you know any kind of impact until 19 you know well into 1918. Then you get over, as you're saying, the, those ships have to be unloaded. That cargo has to be unloaded, and then you have to have the train stock to actually get to the depots, and then you have to have either the motorized or horse transport that's going to get it to the right. So, so sort of every single step of the way, there's there's a problem, and not to mention the manpower issue. I mean, one of the biggest problems for the AEF in terms of morale is how dissatisfied non-combatants are behind the lines. I mean, this is an army where only 40% of the men are combatant troops. 60% of the army are in support positions. 30% of those are really unskilled positions, and 30 of them are 30% are, are skilled positions. But that's just going to tell you how wrong we are when we just discount supply lines and logistics in this kind of massive warfare that the army and its organizational structure. And even then, it takes until halfway through the war for them to create services of supply as a separate distinct unit, right, that's going to need its own kind of command structure. So it's, 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 it's learning, you know, and it's learning for the kind of war it's going to fight in World War II for sure, and those supply issues are going to be at the forefront of that. But one of the reasons that, you know, we traditionally relied so much on civilian workers and civilian you know, contractors to provide a lot of these services, and you can't do that in the First World War. France doesn't have any more laborers, right? They, 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 there's nobody to get. You have to detail a lot of your soldiers to do these jobs, and those people are not happy, for the most part, people are not happy in those kinds of positions. So it creates a lot of dissatisfaction behind the lines in terms of what's going on. So, in other words, you have just the, the literal problems of organization, but then you have huge worker, literally worker morale problems, and, and all of this is going to hamper your ability to sustain movement. So you can have an open warfare doctrine all you like, but if you can't sustain movement going forward, it's not going to do you any good to have the right idea. Ideas are nice, but then you have to be able to actually actualize them. And this is a huge, complex, um, bureaucratic military organization that has to be constructed. We recognize it because it's our modern military. But you know, all World War I historians will tell you World War I matters <laughs> tremendously, right? But one reason it really matters if you're interested in military history is this is the birth of the modern military institution as we know it, right? Yeah. This is what it looks like now. 
It, but that's not what it looked like in 1916, right? So that's, that's the big, so the learning curve is tremendous, and, it, and part of the learning curve is what happens in the battlefield, but a lot of it's what happens behind the lines. We have time for one last question right over there. Hi, Mike Anderson, Fisher School, also Orange, California. Yeah, um, California, <laughs> where it's warm and sunny. All, all told, how much, how much combat power was essentially wasted by underutilization or sidelining of African American soldiers? Are we talking multiple divisions or, or smaller numbers? Uh, could you elaborate? Well, I mean, I think that there's two answers. I mean, in terms of numbers of people, you have, you have 400,000, approximately 400,000 African-American soldiers in the military. They're about 11% of the military. And you have uh, 200,000 that go to France. Okay? So that's in, terms of, that's in terms of numbers. But I mean, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go to Doug here on this, right? Like he says, what if Alvin York had not decided to fight? Well, well, we don't know if we had another Alvin York, right? I mean, we don't know what leadership we lost because we never looked for it, right? It's in the sense that, and, and, and I don't want to paint a picture because Jad's going to tell you a different story. He's going to tell you about amazing perseverance and, and accomplishment in the face of, of, of unbelievable challenges. And so there were certainly African-American officers and soldiers who fought valiantly and proved how valuable they could have been to the military if they had been allowed to go farther. But I mean, just by the virtue of the fact, you know, so we have Charles Young, who should have been in charge, he should have been a divisional commander, right? So, but he, he's, he's sick and, you know, relieved of his post because he's African American. You can't have an African American general in charge of white soldiers, right? So if you had been willing, if you had cultivated that talent, um, did you have to have those supersized divisions then? I mean, again, you can kind of go along those lines, but it's, it's an it's a interesting argument, and it's an argument that in 1948 will be embraced. I mean, when the military is desegregated in 1948, part of the reason is it's wrong to discriminate. But the other argument is that this is going to give us the ability to, to fully utilize the manpower that we have access to which we've been wrong in, in ignoring, right? That we're gonna have more, a bit more talent and why have, we, why have we just, you know, refused to do this? So there is a, there's an efficiency argument that as long as, as, as certainly as, as well as a social justice argument that is embraced and I think embraced wholeheartedly by the military now, right? Where the military will see itself as actually the, the American institution in the present day that makes the fullest use of the talent coming to it because, because of, of that change of perspective. Here. Thank you very much. Thank you.